Welcome everyone. I'm Ron Bachman, WGBH's Senior Director of Programming. Before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to the events team who are all behind the scenes producing this afternoon's live virtual event. Abby is our Q&A manager who will be answering many of our audience questions this afternoon. Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Can't wait to connect with you in our Q&A tab. Definitely let us know where you're tuning in from. Jamie is a senior manager who works in our member engagement department and has a special membership offer to share with you later on during the course of the event. Yes, I do, Ron. Thanks very much for joining us and I'll talk to you a little bit later. And Liz, the events producer, will be switching the camera feeds on the back end and keep our event running on schedule. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're so excited to have you here today. This very important conversation. Thanks to all of you. Now, let us get started. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon for a very special virtual lunchtime chat about American Masters upcoming film, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. This American Masters film offers an intimate meditation on the life and works of this gifted writer. Toni Morrison was inspired because as she put it, no one took a little black girl seriously. Toni Morrison, of course, would go on to become the first black female editor at Random House, win a Nobel Prize in literature, as well as a Pulitzer, and have a building named after her at Princeton University. She was also presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama. Over the next hour, we'll have a conversation with the filmmaker and photographer behind this masterful work, Timothy Greenfield Sanders, and a panel of distinguished experts who will join him in the conversation. But before I introduce everyone, I wanted to take a few minutes to orient you to the basics of this Zoom webinar. As a reminder, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see and hear you, alas, our loss. During the course of this virtual event, the way to communicate with us is by posing your questions in the Q&A tab that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So we'll do our best to pose as many questions as we can to our panel this afternoon, but we may not get to every question. Our event staff will be behind the scenes answering the questions we can't answer live during the conversation. If you see a question you want to hear the answer to in the Q&A tab, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon on your screen next to the question. The questions with the most votes will then rise to the top of the queue. In fact, let's have you test the Q&A tab right now by typing in the city and state you are from so we can get a sense of where you're tuning in from this afternoon. Go ahead and give that a shot now. While you're doing that, I will tell you that we also have a fun poll feature. When a poll pops up on your screen during the course of the, uh, actually, hang on a second, one popped up on my screen and it is now blocking the view of my script. So there we go. <laughs> so when a poll popped up on your screen like that during the course of the conversation, simply answer it and it'll disappear from your screen. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the director of Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am, who will share a clip from the film. Timothy Greenfield Sanders has photographed world leaders and major cultural figures, including presidents, writers, actors, and musicians. His photographs are in many permanent museum collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the National Portrait Gallery, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and the Brooklyn Museum. He's produced and directed 13 documentary films, winning a Grammy for his film, Lou Reed, Rock and Roll Heart, and an NAACP Image Award for The Blacklist. The film we're focused on today won the NAACP Image Award for Best Documentary Film and the Critics' Choice Award for Best Biographical Drama. It was also his fourth film to premiere at the Sundance Film Festival. So without further ado, Timothy. Thank you all for being here today. I am uh, honored to be on a panel like this. Uh, you know, I first met Tony in 1981 well, I was a young photographer. She came to my studio in the East Village to sit for a portrait. And I remembered very well, she had uh, great confidence. And as a photographer, you kind of look for that in a subject. You look to maybe in a way, make the subject feel better and feel confident on the set. And Tony didn't need any of that. She was, she was all there. She knew what she was doing. She was smoking a pipe. <laughs> and we became friends that day. Uh, we went on to a long, long friendship, almost 38 years, um, and I photographed her till, uh, till her death, to, to the end of her life. Um, 
you know, she was a great influence on my life, both as a photographer and as a filmmaker. Uh, the themes that I pursued as an artist were very influenced by her. The clip we're going to see now is uh, we, is pulled from the film. It's called The White Gaze. We call it The White Gaze. And it really addresses a number of things, particularly Tony's um, longtime, lifelong um, kind of commitment to exposing the white gaze, uh, the white judgmental eye that, that is on society at, at so much, so many, in so many ways. Um, the clip also highlights a couple of things that I think are important in the film. Tony looks directly at camera and it was a way to make it so that Tony tells her story and that she's the center of the film. The others look off camera and talk about her. And I combined that, those two looks uh, in this film because I think it, it, was, it could be very effective. It turned out to be very effective. Um, I, uh, it was a risky thing to do because you don't know if it's going to really work. Um, there's also, you're going to see work by African American artists because I felt there was a great connection there that was important. Um, the film also, uh, the clip also has some very special B-roll and uh, you're going to also hear the music uh, from Catherine Bostic, who is an extraordinary composer who scored the film to, scored the, uh, scored directly to the film. So let's watch this clip now and then we'll, we'll be able to talk about it and, and everything else. Thank you. To introduce the other members of today's panel who will participate in a discussion of the film and of Ms. Morrison's work. Dr. Dana Williams is a professor of African American literature and chair of the Department of English at Howard University. She's a specialist in contemporary African American literature. She's president of the Toni Morrison Society, past president of the Association of the Departments of English Executive Committee, chair of the Black American Literature and Cultural Forum for the Mod Modern Languages Association, and past president of the College Language Association, the oldest and largest professional organization for faculty of color who teach languages and literatures. Dr. David Carrasco is the Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America with a joint appointment with the Department of Anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at the Harvard Divinity School. He's a Mexican-American historian of religions with particular interest in Mesoamerican cities as symbols and the Mexican-American borderlands. He's a co-producer of the film Alambrista, the director's cut about undocumented Mexican farm workers in the United States. He has received the Mexican Order of the Aztec Eagle, the highest honor the Mexican government gives to a foreign national. Moderating our discussion today is Tina Martin. She's an Edward R. Murrow award-winning and Emmy-nominated television radio reporter and host in Boston. She's the host of World Channel's Local USA, a national television magazine series. She's also an associate professor of the practice of journalism at Boston University. Tina has reported regularly for the WGBH local television series, Greater Boston, and has served as a fill-in host for the station's longstanding television program, Basic Black. On the radio side, she has reported for 89.7 FM and has contributed to NPR, PBS NewsHour, KPBS, and WGBY. Please join me in welcoming our guests onto the virtual stage this afternoon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tina. Thank you very much, Ron. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to our panelists and good afternoon to the more than 400 people who are joining us. Um, I like to think of this as a conversation in our living rooms, which is not hard to imagine because most of us are in our living rooms. So this should be a great conversation. Um, Timothy, uh, let's start with you uh, because you were friends with Toni Morrison for 38 years. Um, how did you get her to uh, sign on to uh, having you do this film? Or was it a hard sell? It was around uh, 2014 that I started to talk to Tony about it. Um, you know, when I suggested it, she did not say no, which I took as a yes, <laughs> because Tony was always very direct. If, if she had not wanted to do it, that would have been the end of it right there. So I thought there was an opening. And, I, you know, her biggest concern, interestingly, was 
would it take away from her own work? What would, what would it require of her? So once we kind of established those parameters, um, I started to see if I could raise the money and uh, do all the things that one does as a filmmaker. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm so lucky that we got this film made, that Tony got to see the film uh, when it was finished. And what did she say about the film? <laughs> when she, I sat with her in her house and we watched it and she turned to me and she said, I like her. <laughs> <laughs> which is very classic Morrison, I, I would say. Lots of personality. So David, you were also a, a longstanding friend of Toni Morrison. And so for you watching this film, what was that like as someone who was a, a dear friend of hers? Well, you know, as someone with a Mexican American background who grew up near Washington DC, which they used to call the chocolate city, I was somehow prepared to work with Toni and then we became friends and traveled together in Mexico and some other places. Uh, and, uh, you know, I miss her, I miss her a lot. But when I see this film, uh, I'm, I meet her again. And I think that uh, what Timothy and his team did was just tremendous because those of us who, who read her but never met her, well, here's your chance to meet Toni Morrison. And as a fa in fact, uh, with this film, in a sense, we gather together at the river, not only of her life, but of her books. And I think that combination is really special. And so uh, uh, I, I'm just so glad to, to be a part of the project and to, to be able to see what now everybody can see. So I think it's going to be wonderful that American Masters is going to be sharing this uh, with the whole country. And Dana, you are at Howard University, which is Toni Morrison's alma mater, where she got her undergraduate degree. Um, talk to us, I have two questions for you. The first is, what are the conversations right now on campus about Toni Morrison? So one of the things that I'll say is I hope um, the conversations are influenced in part by some of the work that we're doing as faculty. Um, I know, for instance, this semester, I taught a graduate seminar on Toni Morrison and her editorship at Random House for the first half of the semester. And then our post-COVID moments were actually um, some of the novels. Um, and it was just uh, really interesting to see the students think about it from the perspective of both a living author, but then also someone who had actually walked the same halls where they were, um, that had thought the way that they thought about life and culture. So I was really appreciative of the clip that we just saw that talked about one sovereignty because we have the benefit at Howard and at so many of our HBCUs um, to have that kind of sovereignty where you're not overly consumed with the white gaze, you're talking to each other, for each other, and that um, wonderful, wonderful quote of one of Toni Morrison's students, uh, Stokely Carmichael, who then, uh, of course, changed his name to Kwame Ture at Howard, um, there's everything um, in the African world and it's opposite. So we get to talk to each other without uh, the difficulty of that gaze and then without the difficulty of needing translation. Um, on the undergraduate side, uh, similarly, we've read um, probably every Morrison novel, um, either as a part of our common text project um, that has been going on in the English department for years where our first year students all read the same book. And then the humanities courses, which Morrison taught while she was on faculty at Howard, are also very much influenced by her work, but then also by her thinking, so that there's a shift even from the way that we talk about the Odyssey or the way that we talk about Hamlet. Um, Morrison quoted any number of times how um, she couldn't write a paper. And I think um, Timothy actually captures this in one of the interviews in the film. She couldn't write a paper on the black characters in Shakespeare. So one of the things that I think that she did as a faculty member was to make sure that students who came behind her didn't have that problem. The last thing that I'll say um, really quickly is at Howard, Morrison is one of our luminaries. So I think that she was always quite pleased to be in such good company. Um, and that's a lot of the work that she also did as an editor to be able to bring so many people to the table so she would be clear for herself and other people that she wasn't in this thing alone, that there were peers and there were people writing and thinking the way that she was interested in writing and sharing with other people. And so David, you had an opportunity to actually travel with Toni Morrison. Um, Talk to us about uh, those opportunities and what they, you know, what was the basis of the travel? Was it recreation? Was it research? I know you worked with her on one of her books. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you. Let me just add something about what Dana Williams said so well. 
And I think it's going to be great for your viewers, especially the students, to know that Toni Morrison spent like 25 years of her life on college campuses. Yeah. Uh, she liked students and she liked to read the theory and the history. And I remember her telling me, man, the, the critical thinking is so good. That's one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, and so I met her at Princeton and um, we connected and she actually asked me to do some research for her novel, um, uh, <clears throat> Paradise, because she was interested in the theme of paradise and also she knew I worked in Latin American religions and she wanted to do, uh, she wanted to know more about the way in which Afro-Brazilian women did their rituals. And so I did this and we, we became uh, <clears throat> you know, friends and she became interested in my work in Mexico um, and she also wanted to meet uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, the great Colombian writer. And I, uh, through, through Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican writer, I arranged that. And we traveled to Mexico to see not only the Aztec pyramids, which she was greatly interested in, but also, um, also uh, Garcia Marquez. So she gave a talk at the uh, National University during the interim period when students weren't on campus. But when we got there, we couldn't get out of the car because people all came to see Toni Morrison. And the Mexicans knew Toni Morrison, they identified with her writings because they felt in some way, even as she talked about the black struggle for freedom, that she was also talking about them. And uh, she, she greatly appreciated that reception. And I think it's, it's an important thing to know that there's an international Toni Morrison as well. And that's one of the things I learned by traveling with her. And she was able to connect with everyone. I mean, she's one of my sheroes and many of the people who are watching and who will be watching the film tomorrow. Um, so Timothy, with that having been said, was it difficult to figure out who you were going to include in the film? Because there are so many people who could say so much about Toni Morrison. Well, if, uh, you remember that Toni was a great editor and uh, I presented her with a long, long list of names. And she took out her red editing pencil and crossed out most of the names. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in a way, she curated that list for us. And I'm so grateful that she did uh, for a number of reasons, but particularly because I don't like to interview someone for a film and then not have that person in the film. So this was a way to really isolate it, to cull it down to 12 people we ended up having. There was one, there was a 13th who didn't make the film, Peter Sellers, he's in the DVD extras. And he didn't make the film only because it was an easy way to pull out seven minutes from the film. Uh, it, was, it was torturous, but uh, Tony was very uh, helpful in that kind of giving us that wide range of people from Angela Davis to Robert Gottlieb to David Carrasco to Farrah Griffin, you know, Paula Giddings, this, this sort of uh, satellite group of people. And um, the film could have been 10 hours and we had such rich material from all of these subjects. And Dana, I, um, no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was actually going to ask you about her time as an editor because I know that's something you wanted to talk about. I was thinking about this as Timothy was talking, uh, really wondering um, how much the audience knows, and they'll get to see some of it in the film, about her work um, as an editor and how very deliberate she was, uh, based on even the people who appeared in the film, uh, how deliberate she was about curating the story and telling the story. So I spent a lot of time in the archives, uh, Random House's archives, where Toni Morrison was editor for more than 20 years of more than 50 books. And I was curious also to think about how she would have guided Timothy into the process without intentionally guiding. So I'll just give you this like quick example, anecdotal story. The first time that I interviewed her to talk about the editorship, um, I said, well, I wanna do the fiction writers. So I wanna focus on Tony K. Bambara, Henry Dumas, Leon Forrest, Gail Jones. And um, at the time, I didn't know that she had also edited John McCluskey. So she said, well, you know, there are these other novels as well. There's this other fiction. And I said, okay. So we sat and we were ready to talk for our 90 minutes. And Renee set us up and we're all ready to go. And she talks about everything except for the novels and the fiction. <laughs> and I say to myself, come on, seriously? But she's such a great and compelling storyteller that you don't stop the storytelling. You just, you know, you go with it. But then I'm sitting there thinking to myself, now I have absolutely nothing left. You know, I don't have anything for the book that I'm actually trying to write. 
And, you know, she said, I'm so excited. I'm so glad that you're doing this project. You know, the editorship was really hard. You know, the work that I was trying to do. And I'm thinking, so why won't you help me more? Like by staying focused, lady. But <laughs> you can't really say that, right? So she gave me this look that suggested, all right, I'll give you a little bit more the next time. And then the next time she started talking about poetry. And then the next time it was, oh, Muhammad Ali, Angela Davis. So part of what I was able to see is this editorship and this conversation about the editorship really couldn't be limited to those fiction writers. We really had to think about all of them. So we began to pull together the list of books that she could remember, that she had notes from, um, and we came up with a list of 45 or so. And then every time I would say, hey, I ran into this in the archive, is this yours? And she would, you know, either laugh and say, oh, geez, you know, something like memory has escaped me on this one. Yes, I did that. Um, and with this you know, really, really sense, this fond sense of humor, when she started to talk about some writers, you would lose the rest of the conversation. If you started talking about Angela Davis or Tony K. Bombar, you were done for the day. So I would avoid talking about those writers so that I could get in some other parts of the conversation. So all of that to say, I was curious how much of that kind of gentle guidance where you don't even know you're being guided, you think you know where you're going and she lets you think you know where you're going only to get to the point where she knew you would have gone in the beginning. And that was just the kind of mind that she had. You know, we have, um, thank you for that, Dana. This is all, you know, this is fantastic. We do have over 400 people joining us. So I wanna get to a couple of questions if that's okay with the panel. Um, we have Sherry Campbell, who is from um, Ohio. Uh, you were friends with Tony for 38 years. Was there anything new you learned about Tony in the process of making the film? And if so, what was the most interesting or surprising? And she also says, come visit Lorraine, Ohio, when you feel okay to travel. <laughs> this is to me? Yeah. Yes, that's to you. Uh, you know, L Lorraine, Ohio was a revelation for us in the film. Johanna Giebelhaus, uh, the editor of the film, uh, went out there and spent days there uh, with the Historical Society and uh, the library there and, and um, Sh Sherry. And, um, you know, we, Johanna unearthed incredible images that hadn't really been seen before. Pictures of the town that had been kind of shot in the 30s and 40s and buried away in these archives. So we were able to access extraordinary uh, material that way. And, uh, the, you know, Lorraine was, was a, 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 I think, a very happy memory for Tony in many ways. And when we talked about it with her, it was a place where she felt very comfortable and is where she became a, a real scholar. I think she, you know, she loved reading. We talk about that in the film. Reading was so important. She worked in the library. So um, we couldn't have made this without uh, Johanna's wonderful visit to, to Lorraine, Ohio and, and the help we got there. Excellent. Okay. Um, audience, please feel free to chime in. We are looking at your questions. We're taking your questions. We want to engage with you. This is an opportunity uh, for you to uh, <laughs> ask any questions prior to seeing this film. So certainly um, go into your Q&A and ask us a question and we're trying to answer as many questions as we can. This question is for David. What does Tony's work and her words in this film teach us about the place, value, and prophetic obligation of the brown Latinx gaze? Wow, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And, that's from JPS. I don't know who JPS is, but if you want JPS, you can go back in and tell us your full name and we'll announce JPS, it. JPS, yeah, I think I know JPS. So, okay. uh, well, you know, I have a line in the film uh, that says that uh, for me, Toni Morrison is the Emancipation Proclamation of the English language. And, and by that, I meant not only does she, in a sense, uh, you know, put the white gaze aside, uh, but as she said, she wanted to be among Black people. She wanted to write for Black people. And what has happened is she's come to be among people of color and, and, uh, and write about, about their experiences. And, you know, for me, and I think for many Latinos in this country, Toni Morrison's books are what I call sacred bundles. And when we, we read these bundles, we open up uh, so much, not only of her own vision of the world, but of of our experience of the world beyond the black experience. Um, and 
um, we learn so much about ourselves. I remember one time in uh, Boulder, Colorado, where she was giving a talk and afterward there was a long line of people that wanted to, to have her sign. And they weren't just asking for a celebrity to sign, they were asking for her to speak to them. And so many of them talked to her as though she had healed somebody in her family. Uh, and what this means for the Brown community is something that she talked about in the, in the um, reading from the film uh, from Sula, where she talked about the magnificent hatred that black people feel. Well, brown people feel that too. And the thing about Toni Morrison's novels and her person is that, as you see in this film, there's a magnificence about her. And I remember one time we were in Mexico and we were in the green room after she gave a talk. And this Mexican journalist came up to me and he said to me, I can't believe it. And I said, what is it you can't believe? And he said, to be here in the same room with Toni Morrison. And I said, yeah, isn't it wonderful? And then he said, it's like being with a divine person. <laughs> mm. It's like being with a divine person because the Mexicans, they saw the magnificent goodness in Toni Morrison. So I think that's the way I would think about answering that question. Thank you. Um, Imelda has a question. This is probably for you, Dana. What is the book that freshman students are reading at Howard University? Well, I'm not sure exactly if she meant which of the Morrison books we've read. Uh, most recently we read um, The Bluest Eye and Song of Solomon. And for the fall semester, we, the most recent fall semester, our common text was um, Repair, a very timely book about reparations. Uh, but Morrison text, I don't know that we have not read them all. So that's a tough one. <laughs> okay. Um, Andrea Baker, I'm just trying to get to all these because I see them popping up and I know people have questions. Andrea Baker says, although it's nearly impossible to speculate, what would Toni Morrison say about the Black Lives Mo Matter movement today? Any one of you can take that. Who wants to take it first? Timothy? You know, I think I would never speak for Tony <laughs> to begin with, but I, I think what Tony has been saying throughout her life is so relevant today. You, you could go back to the 1993 interview with Charlie Rose, for example, and uh, which is in the film, a clip from it. That is so on target to uh, the, the, the idea of the white gaze and to how white people need to step forward. It's their, pro racism is a problem they created and they need to do something about it. And she said that, you know, 27 years ago. Um, so, you know, I think reading Tony, watching the film, you're gonna get a lot out of uh, why she's so special in, in this moment as well. Does anybody else want to take that or should I go on to some more questions? Dana, do you want to? Yeah, I think I'd say um, read Plain in the Dark, The Origin of Others, and some of those essays and the source of self-regard, particularly in light of the point that Timothy just made, the education that white people have to do for themselves, because you keep in mind as the clip that we um, saw was very clear. Those novels are for and by and about and as a part of a community of Black people. So read them, you get what you get out of them. But if you're trying to learn as the like contemporary lingo is now, how to be an anti-racist, playing in the dark is as good of a start as anything, but it, because it is very clear how those foundational myths of American exceptionalism cause all kinds of problems. I think Paradise does that work as well. Uh, people who want to deal with the fiction would do well to read that one where she really begins to interrogate the question of whiteness and whether or not it is something that is beyond the social construct and does it matter. Um, similarly, that short story recitative where, you know, you're left trying to figure out which of the girls in that story is black or white. And again, having to think about whether or not it matters. I think you can't really go wrong with home um, and a mercy which critically in this moment um, helps us to think about what is America other than a settler colony? What was it before um, the onset of enslavement and what kinds of myths do you have to shore up to make it possible for you to essentially take African people to make them capital and take land from people who live in a space? And so you get I, I think all of those books actually speak to Black Lives Matter. The final thing that I'll say really quickly is you got to read a lot. There were few people that were smarter 
few people that were more red. Part of the reason that she could be in so many conversations in so many places is because she was always reading and reading across genres and reading across authors and so on. So be in conversation with what other people have already said. Excellent. Okay, we have more questions. All right, Flory Johnson, what helped the young Toni Morrison develop the confidence and perspective to free her books from the quote, white gaze? And how is that growing up in our society uh, didn't repress that talent? David, David, do you want to take that one? Well, I think the film, you know, you see it in the film and uh, it's almost like she was born with that courage. It was something about the very young Toni Morrison, uh, certainly the Toni Morrison, you know, who, uh, who arrived at Howard University. There was a playfulness of mind. There was a, a, a courage. Uh, you know, as, as uh, Timothy said when he first met her, uh, there was this there was a sense of self-regard right there. Uh, I think she got it from her, her family. I think her mother and father, uh, as is shown in the film, and I think that's one of the great things of the film, all these years, I never saw any pictures of her parents until we got to this film. And you can see the strength of the father and the mother uh, and, and the kind of community she grew up in. You know, she grew up in an integrated community. Um, and therefore, I don't think she was so afraid of white people in terms of all they could do because they, they exchanged with the neighbors. Uh, I mean, there were plenty of incidents, but Toni Morrison seemed to come into the world with a kind of confidence and strength. I also think the film shows uh, how important, this is what Professor Dana has already said, how important reading was to her. She really read a lot as a young girl growing up and never stopped reading. Uh, and 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 taking what she read and changing it in terms of what then came out of her. And so I think there was this great process of, of apprehension and then transformation. Uh, we have, uh, we're running low on time, but I wanted to get to some more questions. Aisha asks, is anyone aware of plans to posthumously publish any of Toni Morrison's work? She was extremely prolific. Timothy, David, Dana, do you know of any? I don't. A lot of the essays in the Source of Self-Regard are pieces that she was clear about needed to be in um, book form. Um, so the archives at Princeton, for instance, I haven't done a very close comparison, but I would say about 90% of the stuff that's, you know, in Princeton and, and um, at Random House in some places, I think most of it's, it's published. Um, I had heard rumors about there being an unfinished novel or a novel that she was working on, but um, the estate, um, we assume will handle that um, wonderfully. I mean, having been an editor for all of the years that she was, she was fully aware of how to get her house in order. <laughs> all right, Crystalia asks, in what ways did Toni Morrison concern herself with children's literature? Oh, Anything? those books um, that she did with Slade are incredible. The Who Got Game series? I like those as an adult. So anybody who hasn't picked up Toni Morrison and Slade Morrison uh, as illustrator, the Who Got Game series, um, and it does that same thing. It reorients the myth. It begins to suggest to us that things that we take as like foregone conclusions, don't believe them, question everything. <laughs> anyone else? Does anyone else want to I would just in? say, you know, Toni, as it shows in the film, Toni raised two children. She raised two sons. Uh, and largely by herself with the help of her, her own immediate family. So she knew about children and what they, you know, what their lives were like, what their growing up was like. And she, she then, you know, joined with Slade and, uh, and did these uh, great books that are, that are fun and funny and insightful. So uh, I think the children's literature question is an excellent one. And uh, this is from Janice, and we have about a minute and a half. Uh, how does Toni Morrison's work translate into other languages? Is it possible to convey her message in a voice any other, in any other language than English? I would just say that um, in the making of the film, we, we visited, we, we spent time at one of the Toni Morrison Society events. And there were people from all over the world. There were people who had flown in from Japan to whom Morrison meant as much as any author. I mean, it was a remarkable experience to see that. And I think uh, Tony was translated into dozens and dozens of languages around the world. And um, she was an international figure. Uh, we, we make a point of saying that in the film. And 
Uh, one quick question before we, uh, we're going to have Timothy talk just a little bit about the film and why folks should watch it. Uh, this is a very interesting question from, um, who is this coming from here? Oh, from uh, Margie. Um, she says, how did Toni Morrison change over the years, not just professionally, but personally? Does anyone want to take that? So it's, it, it, we all change <laughs> over the years. Um, in, I don't know um, how to answer that exactly. I think her writing was always as important to her throughout her life, you know, as anything, and her family and her friends. Um, I don't see, a, a, you know, a great change that way. No. I think one of the changes uh, that you see is in the film is um, when her father passed away, yeah. uh, she then began to realize that she had not written from a male point of view. And so through the help of her father's memory, she wrote A Song of Solomon, which was the first of her novels to, to include a male, a male voice that way. And I think that, um, you know, later in life, you do see some changes in the novel Home and, and some others. But um, let's just say she was... Uh, to me, she was magnificent all the way through. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty, uh, that sounds just about right. Even though I didn't know her, you all had the pleasure of meeting her. I never did. Um, Timothy, we are going to give you a few minutes just to uh, talk to our more than 400 people who are here today, just about uh, this film and why they should watch it tomorrow. You know, I'm, uh... I, I would say humbled and honored to have made this film. Um, you know, I had a strong desire to do it because there was no great film on Toni Morrison uh, and there needed to be. Um, and I also felt that n new generations were not as versed in her work and her career as, as earlier generations. So it was a way to kind of bring a new audience to her work, I thought. Yeah. Um, you know, film is a very important part of our culture. And I think Tony understood the power of film. And maybe when I went to her to say I wanted to do a documentary, she, she knew there was a place for that. She had never wanted to write a biography, an autobiography, and she didn't allow biographies. Um, so this was a remarkable chance to really tell her story. Um, my long friendship was vital. Um, you know, the trust is something that a filmmaker has to have to make a good film. Um, I also um, had trust from a number of the people who were in the film because as a photographer, I'd photographed them and knew them somewhat. Angela Davis, Hilton Ailes, Fran Lebowitz, uh, Oprah, Richard Daniel Poor, um, Walter Mosley, all had sat for me before. Um, you know, I was blessed with a, an extraordinary subject um, who was very adept at being on camera and who had tremendous charm and was profound. And I mean, where could you find a better subject than Toni Morrison? They just don't, they don't exist, I think. Absolutely. Uh, Timothy, I hate to cut you off. Time is just going here. We're having such a wonderful conversation. I need to send it over to Jamie Reese, who's our senior uh, manager for membership engagement, to tell you more about a special offer, and hopefully we can get to some more questions. Hi, Jamie. Hi there, Tina. Hi there, everybody at home. Uh, thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us and taking part in our virtual discussion about American Masters, Toni Morrison's The Pieces I Am. Important programs like this one are made possible because of WGBH members. Those are viewers like you who want to keep public media alive and well and accessible to all. And I wanted to take a few minutes to share details about a digital membership benefit. We are pleased to offer donors to show our thanks. When you support WGBH and shows like American Masters, your donation of $5 a month or more also unlocks a whole new world of content. In fact, you can view more than a thousand hours of PBS and local programs with WGBH Passport 
through PBS app on your television using a digital media player like Apple TV or Roku. And as most of us are staying indoors a little more often these days, this is such a great thing to have handy. You can binge watch, catch up on shows you may have missed, or revisit your old favorites. The best part is you can watch wherever and whenever you choose because you can access WGBH Passport on your TV through Roku, your Apple apps, or a video portal. And you can even watch on your computer and your phone. Doesn't get easier than that. And if you're like me and you love to watch your favorite shows multiple times, well, you're in luck because American Masters, Toni Morrison's The Pieces I Am, will be streaming on Passport beginning tomorrow, Tuesday, June 23rd at 8 p.m. and will be through the end of the month. Please make that $60 contribution today and begin your Passport experience. All you have to do, it's really simple, is go to wgbh.org slash support events to sign up. It's that simple. In just a few minutes, you'll be well on your way to enjoying a portfolio of PBS content right at your fingertips on your preferred digital device. Please become a member. WGBH's critical backing from the community is a big part of the reason that we're able to bring audiences insightful, objective, and necessary information about our past, our present, and our future. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. And now, back to Tina with more. Thanks, Jamie. All right, let's see if we can get a few more questions in here. We have a few more minutes. Okay, Timothy, this is from Herb Gross. This is for you. How uh, assured are you that your film is made without a white gaze? Oh, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Um, I, I can't be assured. I, I did try to surround myself with other voices throughout the making of the film, from from Micheline Thomas, who did the opening montage, to Catherine Bostick's music, to all of the voices that were interviewed for the film. Um, it's something that I was keenly aware of. and. Um, you know, I think Tony trusted me to do it. <laughs> That's an enormous weight on my shoulder. Uh, so, um, you're, you're, you know, it's 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 something you you as a you you deal with at all times. You're trying to see if you're thinking in a way that's really the right way to think. And I and I always challenge myself that way. And the great thing is that she was there to edit you all the way, wasn't she? She was. You know, I think that. The, the film really was Tony telling her story. And I think that it, the more I could step out of that, the better. So it was the decisions of having her talking to camera that I mentioned earlier, the way to make it so that Tony is in charge. You know, it's, it's her story to tell. All right, we're a little light on time, but let's see if we can get to some more questions. Susie asks, this is a good one. Who are the Tony Morrisons of today? Not exactly like her, but truth tellers and trailblazers. Dana, we'll start with you. Well, this one always gets me in trouble, especially with my writer friends, but I gotta say Tayari Jones, um, which of course her American marriage is just like off the charts. Um, and by today, I'm gonna also still include writers like Henry Dumas and Tony Kate Bambara. Um, I really like Yag Yassi. Um, I think Chimamanda Adichie's Half a Yellow Sun um, is really incredible. Um, I'm trying to think of a guy writer very immediately. Percival Everett has, you know, new books out that really are in conversation with Black people and around Black people, but similarly universal. Daniel Black is an incredible writer, um, becoming hands down the best book I've read in 10 years. Um, so I'll stop there and like let somebody else get in trouble for forgetting to mention yep. somebody they're very close to. Let me, my text message is probably blowing up like, seriously? <laughs> and reach Don to Cot, you know? <laughs> David, do you have any, any, uh... Uh, you know, I'll just say this story, you know, Toni Morrison was greatly influenced by, uh, by Garcia Marquez. Uh, she said so, and uh, we, she and I worked on a book toward the end of her life, uh, one of the last books uh, called Goodness and the Literary Imagination, in which I have an interview with her where she talks about the impact that he had on her writing. So there's this connection between Toni and certain Latin American writers that 
I think is important. But, you know, I don't know if there's any Toni Morrison today. There's other great writers who we have to look at in their own way. But it's like comparing people, you know, with Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, everybody else falls a little short in my view. Um, but Tony's out there to be beckon us to understand her and to do the great deep work that uh, needs to be done and is being done. Um, a question from Anjali Bahadi, Bahadi, I think. At, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, but thank you for joining us. What would you say is the essential learning that we take away from Toni Morrison that our society today should work with? Does mm -hmm. anybody want to take that? I've been thinking a lot about the conversation she's having about othering and how we impose certain restrictions on people just because they aren't like us and we don't understand us. That conversation she has about the stranger uh, being a construction that is so incredibly unnecessary. Um, so in today's moment, especially really understanding the origin of others because it's like so much it really is a myth that is intended to perpetuate this national narrative that somehow americans are exceptional and that translated at the time to white americans are exceptional and white property men are exceptional so i think the way that she clues us into how false that conversation is um, is just as she says in the film once you get rid of that the whole world just opens up I think that, um, you know, as uh, Professor Williams said, from plain I'm going to convince David to call me Dana before okay, this. Is the <laughs> Ever since Sister Dana said this, uh, from plain in the dark till now, one of the things Tony teaches us is the psychology of racism, which in part is the projection onto people of color, evil brews that are within people themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, she talks about this all again and again to be aware of the kind of difficulties and the smallness and, and problems people have within themselves and how they, they that gets triggered when they meet the other and they project onto people uh, their own problems and then blame the people that they projected it onto for the problems uh, that they say they're bringing to them. That kind of deep, deep psychological insight's been there all along and we see it so much now in the and the power of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, in a sense, the Black Lives Matter movement is Toni Morrison's writing writ public, even more public in so many ways. And I think that's really crucial. In the film, there's one moment where she's asked in a way, or uh, how come you aren't out there marching? And she said, I wanted to keep a record. I wanted to keep a record. And the record that she kept is now what Black Lives Matter in many ways is acting out, which is criticizing this kind of projection of issues within the white gaze itself that have been pasted upon black and brown people uh, and then blame them for those problems. And Timothy, do you want to add anything very quickly? It was almost yeah, I would, I would say that Tony talked about Shakespeare and she said that he knows or senses or digs up so much truth about human beings. And I think that is really true about Toni Morrison, that that's what her, she was able to do with such beauty and creativity and power. Let's try one more question before we get out of here because I know everyone's engaged. Ann Nathan wants to know, what do you think Ms. Morrison would think about the growth of African-American and African women writers who write in the science fiction fantasy world and did she mentor any of them? As quickly as we can get an answer. If anybody has one. Dana? Great question. I have no idea. If she I want to say anyway, she's think... aware of Octavia Butler. I want to say there's some correspondence between her and Octavia Butler trying to get a blurb for her or something, but that's a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to play with that one for a while. I mean, her, her influence is, is monumental. I don't think we can, we can really capture how powerful her influence was. I know she was aware of Shirley Ann Williams' Dessa Rose. Um, and so Shirley Ann Williams wasn't a sci-fi writer, but Kindred really does that very kind of work that um, we see in, no, no, no. Um, oh gosh, I'm losing Dessa Rose's, Dessa Rose, yeah, Shirley Ann Williams' Dessa Rose does the same kind of work that Kindred does. Mm -hmm. David? I uh, know, but I think that uh, she would have, my, my the knowledge I have of Tony, she would have liked it. She would have been supportive of it as, as long as the, as long as it's you know good writing, you know good writing. 
You know, craft was so important to her. Good craft, like quality craft. She talks often about how it pained her to see a book poorly edited. Um, just in terms of like the line, the word choice, like why would you choose that word? It's not the perfect word. <laughs> well, geez, this hour has went by so quickly. Um, Timothy, I'll give you one minute. We have one minute left. If you can uh, summarize us in one minute, that would be phenomenal. I, and then I, can't, I can't possibly do that, but I can, I can urge you to tune in uh, tomorrow night, eight o'clock uh, Eastern time to a film that, that we all worked so hard on that I think is a great film. I, I say that as the director and producer, it's, it's a great film. And it's a great film because it's Tony really talking to us. It's an intimate place where you're, you're able to sit there and feel like she's in the room with you. So please watch it and tell everyone else to watch it. Um, I'd be, we'd all be very happy if you do. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate your time and this great conversation. That is our program this afternoon. We want to thank all of you for spending your lunch hour with us. Please tell all of your friends and save the date and tune in for tomorrow, as Timothy said, Tuesday, June 23rd at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Central Time on PBS to enjoy American Masters, Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. It also streams on the PBS video app and pbs.org slash Toni Morrison. And as Jamie Moore, as, as Jamie Reese mentioned earlier, if you're a GBH member, WGBH member, you can watch the film on PBS Path Passport 2 or become a member and to receive this benefit you would, um, be able to watch it on PBS Passport. Before you leave this afternoon, if you can take a minute to fill out our survey that's going to pop up, you're going to see it on your screen. We really appreciate your feedback on that. As always, you can stay informed on virtual events that we have coming down the pike by visiting our events page. That's wgbh.org slash events. Please stay safe and healthy. Have a great afternoon, and we really appreciate you spending some time with us. Take care. <laughs>